The federal petroleum mandate, which is the biggest impediment to consumer fuel choice in the U.S., requires that the vast majority of fuel consumers buy be petroleum-based. Most people are unaware that for nearly 40 years, federal law has required that any fuel you put into your vehicle must first be approved by the EPA. As you might expect, petroleum-based gasoline was grandfathered into the system. Today, if you use an unapproved fuel in your car or truck, you're subject to a $25,000 per day fine. I should note that those of you smart enough to drive flexible fuel vehicles are exempt from this federal uh, restriction. But currently, the EPA-approved fuels are E0, E10, and E15. From a petroleum perspective, that means that the approved fuels range from 100% petroleum down to 85% petroleum. American motorists, therefore, are under an 85% federal petroleum mandate. Let me provide an example to illustrate. Let's say I drove an older, non-flex fuel vehicle pickup to a blender pump in Fredericksburg, Iowa and selected E30, 30% 30 ethanol, because I like the price and the higher octane. Even though I was willing to take the personal responsibility for that choice, I would have broken federal law, and if caught, would have been fined $25,000 each day the E30 was in my old truck. Federal law requiring that virtually every gallon of fuel sold to passenger vehicles in the U.S. contain a minimum of 85 petroleum is not a free market. It is Big Oil's best kept secret, the federal petroleum mandate. Consumers should be allowed to take personal responsibility for their fueling choices and not be restricted from, from choosing petroleum alternatives by federal law. Mr. Clovis, if elected to the U.S. Senate, would you support legislation ending the federal petroleum mandate and allow Americans to choose the fuel they wanted? On principle, yes, but again, the, the uh, mechanics of that are going to be very difficult because uh, right now uh, the infrastructure is, we don't, the ethanol doesn't have ac access to the infrastructure. We can't get the blender pumps sold. Uh, we can't do a lot of the other issues to get, uh, because of the control that, that oil has on this. So again, what we're really talking about is antitrust legislation, is how do we go after big oil in, in an antitrust perspective? Because they control the entire, uh, from, from, from the wellhead to, to the tank of your car, they control almost every aspect of that. So what we're really talking about is antitrust legislation against that so that we'll have some form or access to competition. And what does that mean? Does that mean retailers get a break on, the, on blender pumps? Probably that has to be part of it. Does that mean that we, uh, we figure out a way to gain access to pipelines so that we can move ethanol at a much lower cost? You know, I talked to one of my dear friends sitting in the audience here about this very issue the other day. But what is it that drive, would help drive down your cost in, in, in this? And his immediate answer was access to the infrastructure. I think that's an important part of this. I mean, do we create incentives to create infrastructure separate for ethanol, or do we gain access through antitrust legislation against big oil to gain access to that infrastructure so that we can move ethanol at a, at a lower cost? And, and blending aspects of this, can we go to a higher blend? There are many people, and I've had people talk to me about this, that we can go to the E28, E30. It's probably a better fuel for us to be burning in our, in our vehicles out there, uh, as long as we have the engines that are, that are built to do that. And if that's the right answer, then the market ought to be able to drive that. Do we create those market incentives? I think so. But the way we have to do that is to be able to figure out a way to get an antitrust legislation or to go after the oil, the oil control here, because essentially that's what we have. We have a handful of companies that control the oil and control access to our, our tanks in, our, in this country. And if that's the way this has to go, then that's the legislation that ought to be brought forward. Thank you, Mr. Clovis. If elected to the U.S. Senate, Mr. Jacobs, would you support legislation ending the federal petroleum mandate and allow Americans to choose the fuel they wanted? I, I would, and I think this is a uh, another example of uh, classic government regulatory overreach. Um, Think about that for a minute. What the question was, if I choose to put E30 in my car, I face up to a $25,000 penalty every day? What is that all about? 
I, I think the real problem here we have, is, and it's not just the EPA, and I had a lot of experience in working with the EPA uh, over my career in the, in the power industry. Uh, they've had a lot to say about uh, air and water uh, standards, as you might imagine. But I, I think the real issue, we, we would all agree that the regulatory framework we've had in this country is totally out of control. It has caused businesses to stop growing. In fact, I was just in uh, eastern Iowa earlier this week, and I heard a story from somebody who had been in business for 62 years that decided to close their business because they could no longer comply with government regulations. That makes no sense at all. So the real question is, what are we going to do about this? Well, here's one place we can start. We can require any new federal standard to be reviewed by an independent third party for a cost-benefit analysis. I mentioned I've had a lot of experience in dealing with the EPA, and i got to tell you, when they do their cost-benefit analysis, it is the fox guarding the hen house. We need independence in that review, and we can do that by starting to require an independent cost-benefit analysis as to way to get our arms around uh, these regulations that are out of control. Here's another thing we can do. I'd like to see a biannual review to Congress by every federal agency that inventories all of their regulations and what the cost of complying with those regulations are and what the benefits are. And I think if we get an inventory of these things, we can start to work on rationalizing because the way that our federal agencies work is we take old regula regulations, we layer new ones on top, and then we layer new ones on top of that, and new ones on top of that. And before we get too far along the way, we have something, this Byzantine, complex mess of regulations that no one could possibly uh, have a chance of complying with. 